Salutations, crustaceans. I'm Lobster, and I'm here with the very well-known Dan Lakin, founder of Lakeland Bases and D. Lakin Guitars and uh, curator of many other projects. And we are here to talk with him about his history with the bass, history in music, and where he's at now and where he wants to go. So Super. thank you for joining me, Dan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I love to talk. <laughs> and we love to listen so uh, first and foremost where'd you get your start with music and or instrument building what came first for you well music came first i go back to uh first song i remember it's funny because it turns out it's joe osborne on bass uh top of the world by the carpenters so that's like 72 so i would be eight years old and I just remember that song making me feel good and a happy feel to it. And uh, so I started listening. My parents had a very small music collection. You know, we had a television house. Usually it's music or TV. My house was a TV house. Uh, but there was a little record shop. Uh, and I would ride my bike. It was a cock robin. I'd get a cheeseburger, ice cream cone, and then I'd ride over to the red, little red shack. And they would have the uh, top 40 list and then bins of 45s. And they were, you know, whatever, I don't know, 99 cents. or. Then I would buy those. That A couple of years into that, I started getting into albums. And uh, my brother had Sgt. Pepper's, you know, which I thought was a live record, of course. Uh, and uh, the first artist that I really fell into the rabbit hole on was Elton John. And I really loved his playing. I didn't know anything about bass. And in 1976, I moved. I lived in a place called Skokie, which is a suburb of Chicago. And my family moved about four miles from Skokie to Winnetka. Uh, and four miles to an 11-year-old could be 100 miles. I, I'd start over fresh. Uh, and I met a couple guys whose brothers had a rock band in Chicago. Those turns out to be the Piricello brothers and guys that have worked the current owners of Lakeland. But we started a friendship and a musical journey at that time. And the brothers were a little bit older, uh, maybe four, six years older than us. And they were, you know, playing bars and clubs and they rehearsed in the basement of their house. And we were always there listening and uh, I don't remember why, but, you know, when we were 11 years old, we're like, well, it's a, well we got to start playing now. And we went to a little music shop that had Fender. I think the best one they had was like a Music Master, maybe. It was cream-colored and it was hanging. And the, the Piricello brothers, there was two of them, they picked up the guitar and I picked up bass. I didn't know what bass was. And I was just, it had four strings. I figured that might be an advantage, a little less to do. And uh, I started taking lessons, uh, some local music shops. I had some guys come to the house. Uh, and we were in our first band within two or three months. And then I was bit. Then I, I really dug into the equipment side right away. I remember, you know, looking at pictures and seeing the Fender headstock and, and seeing Stanley Clark playing and Alembic on, there was a show called Soundstage. He played Lopsy Lou. It was mind-blowing. And that beautiful Alembic bass he was playing. Oh, yeah. Um, there was a music shop that's still in business called the Music Gallery. And it was four or five miles away. We would hop on a train and take, take off. And we would just hang at the store for two or three hours. You know, I'd buy something every six 10 months and then the rest of the time they just had to put up with us hanging out but they were very nice and we learned quickly i mean you know before i could play a scale i knew who leo fender was i knew that music man was his new line of instruments and it was just real cool and i just felt really attached and then um i the area that i live that i grew up in uh 
has really great school district, very strong music program. So I got into jazz, and I studied at a maniacal, crazy jazz band instructor who knew about Jocko and told us how to pick back by the bridge to get the punchier sound. It was cool. The, the school had six jazz basses, and if you were a student, you got to keep one for the four years that you were there. I got an upright bass that I was able, that I kept at home. I had one at school, one at home. It was a great program. I did some days five periods of nine were music. Orchestra, chamber orchestra, jazz band, uh, private lesson, acoustic, private lesson, electric. So it was just great. Uh, and studying jazz is funny because the, the, the band director, this guy Roger Mills, was not into rock and roll. He thought rock just was the wrong path and it was for simpletons. And he came in, he saw me playing some rock in one of the practice rooms with a couple guys. And the next day he comes in a jazz, he stops, he goes, Dan, how much rock do you do a day? This is way before crack. So how much rock do you do a day? He goes, you know, every hour of rock puts you back two hours in jazz. But anyways, we got, I'm, it was just great. It was in music. and But I realized, and I went to like Jamie Abersall camps. I don't know if you know what those are. They're, summer camps run by uh, a jazz educator and uh, and it were, they were great but I, I just got to know that I was not as good as a lot of these guys the, these jazz players there was a, a level of that I just didn't have and I uh, my parents were not into a musical education uh, anyway you know, if I would have demanded it, I'm sure they would have let me do it. But I was talked out of it. So I went that way. Then uh, college, I played a lot. Played with Piracello. We had a band, SIU. Uh, played three times a week. That was like the, the most practical musical experience I had. And um, really loved it. Uh, but got out of college and... Uh, started uh, messing around with used instruments, uh, buying and selling. Um, first started out with all instruments, guitars, basses, uh, and then decided to specialize. I, I had an, a Vox amp for sale, and a guy came over and he told me he's a specialist. He only buys and sells equipment that the Beatles, models that the Beatles used. And I thought that was cool. It's like, you know, I like guitar, and... Uh, but I know and I love bass, so I'm going to specialize in bass. So I started a little company called Dan Lake and Basses, and this is before the internet. This would be 1989, 1990. Uh, I should also say Bass Player Magazine just came out, and it was really cool because before Bass Player, when growing up, Guitar Player Magazine, if you were lucky, had one article a month about bass and very little in any other magazines. So bass player hit, and all of a sudden, you know, I found this community, and we would I got to send out a list every month, and I would carry maybe 15 to 20 instruments at any time, specializing in Leo Fender designs. I didn't do a lot of vintage, high-end Fender stuff. I was able to find Stingrays pretty readily for between five and eight hundred dollars and then I had Japanese customers who would double my money on them and it, what was great about music mans was there was no uh, this is before any company made a replacement pickup for a music man music offenders were always hot rotted always upgraded mm -hmm. always all the components well music man you couldn't do that there was just no way to do that so every music man was pretty straight. And it was cool. And uh, I met, during this phase of my life, uh, I, I at that time had a day job. I, my family had a business, recycled tires. We had a factory in Chicago. And I really wasn't into it. Um, I met a guy who repaired stuff. And it's funny because he was kind of, usually luthiers are a bit nutty. Uh, and 
I heard about this guy. I was I was kind of panicking. I had a guitar, one of those trade shows, vintage swap meets, and I I called him. I said I heard about you, and I've got a jazz bass, and the neck pickup doesn't work, and I've got this show. And he goes, "How's that my problem?" I'm like, oh boy, one of these. And that was Hugh McFarland, and we quickly became friends. And this is uh, now 92, 93. He would his specialty was fret work. You would people would buy a guitar at Guitar Center, and on the way home stop at Hugh and say, "All right, put your frets in it." And Hugh, uh, again with a specialty in fretting, he also had production experience. He worked at Dean Guitars, which was a Chicago company. Um, he at the uh, time, at least. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was already gone by the time we started. Uh, so we decided in 93 that it would be cool to uh, make a high-end Fender. Now, Sadowski was already doing it, uh, but that was about it. There wasn't a lot on the market. Uh, the Warwick's, Moduluses, uh, the Federas, they're all great bases. But to me, they weren't, <laughs> Michael Rhodes, a Nashville player, has a term, Fender Riveted. They weren't <laughs> Fender derivative enough for me. I liked Fender. I liked Fender, and I liked Fender after Fender. I, I played a G&L bass all through college, El Toro. Pretty Wish I still had it. But, oh, the El Toro uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the P bass, the J bass, and the Stingray, Leo hit it out of the park. Three hits in a row. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think he had the Mustang in there somewhere when he was working as a consultant uh, during the CBS years. Uh, I've actually written a book. I haven't put it all together with the photographs called The Big Three, which is about the P bass, J bass, and the Stingray and how amazing that one guy could come up with these. I mean, the G, the P, especially the 57 and later P, the modern design, mm -hmm. jazz was so cool and so different. But the Stingray, man, the Stingray, every little detail, from the strap button, the electronics, the knobs, the string retainer, everything was re was reimagined, or re every every detail was visited and changed. And the headstock was so cool, the three in one, and they were so smart. And I talked to the guy; his name was Forrest White. He was Fender's one of Fender's right hand men. And I said, "How did you guys?" come up with the three-in-one. He goes, that was my idea. He was so proud of it. And he said, and we got a copyright on it. Copyright is better than a patent. Patent runs out. Yeah. Copyright, as long as you enforce it, is for life. So you never see anybody with a three-in-one headstock. If, if anybody at the exception it, of, of the... It, uh... Yeah, and then they protected it. If anybody does it, it's one thing to own a trademark. It's another thing to police the trademark and come after. And they came after people. You never see a three-in-one, maybe in other countries, but it's interesting. Um, so Hugh and I wanted a high-end Fender. Uh, we settled on Bartolini uh, for the, the tone and his willingness to work with young companies and uh, really do most anything you ask. He was a very pliable guy, very nice. Uh, can be a, could be a little slow with delivery. Uh, and him and his wife, Pat, ran the mom and pop. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great. And uh, so uh, we put our heads together, developed the electronics. My input came, and I, I would say, like, this is the perp perfect neck. We want this shape. Hugh was not a player, so he didn't bring that. But... He had little little things. I mean, really little. Like, let's see if I can get this. You know, like uh, the volute here on mm -hmm. uh, Lakeland. It's it's reinforced because if you look at a lot of old fenders, there's stress cracks. I mean, you don't see headstocks coming off, but you see cracks, and uh, they're just little things that a builder, you know, would come up with. And that was Hughes Hughes uh, input. He pushed for the round bridge. I was never excited about it, but it turned out to be a great way to see our base from far. You could always yeah. tell from our base. 
so that was cool. Um, and uh, we had no idea what we were getting into. We thought, I call it the field of dreams. You know, if you build it, they will come. You know, it doesn't work that way. There's something called marketing. And I just used what I learned as a player and as a fan of bass to go forward with marketing. I said, well, why do I want to play this bass? I want to play it because Paul McCartney plays it. I want to play it, you know, because Chris Squire used it. Uh, and uh, I was a dead end. Phil Lesh, when I first started listening to them, had an Alembic. So that, again, brought me, you know, I, I so uh, that's, I spent a lot more money and time uh, courting players and getting the guitar on TV. We did advertisements pre-internet. You know, we had a website probably two to three years in. Um, social media was not around. Mm -hmm. And you would run a full-page magazine ad. It would cost $5,000 each wow. one. Um, and I knew that endorsements, again, you know, like I said, with getting t national, when somebody would want an endorsement, I would, you know, not trying to be an asshole, but I'd be like, look, what they were asking for free instrument. I said, I need to see that you have national television exposure and more than just once, you know. Um, and we just kind of kind of went forward that way. Um, as a bass player, I found we have a lot in common. Um, I met a guy who played from Ireland and played with a band called The Coors, C-O-R-R-S, who were big in Ireland and the U.K. They, they never really struck gold over here but he was my age and when i'm 56 and but he was he was grew up in the other another you know whatever ten thousand miles away mm -hmm. and it's so much in common you know we listen to the same players and uh we just had a common thread and uh the the happiest days at lakeland were me were when an artist was coming through town lakeland was located about 10 minutes from downtown so i would always be able to pop out Grab the, the typical day would be at 9 o'clock. They'd call and say they're ready. Uh, pick them up by 10 o'clock. We're at the factory going through. Then we hit lunch. And then I take them back to the hotel. They make the sound check. The bus call, 3 p.m. And then I'd meet them at the show. And I went to a lot of concerts. A lot of mostly enjoyed. <laughs> Not all of them, but uh, some of the heavier stuff. Like, Geezer Butler and that that kind of stuff was a little rough, but uh, in general, I enjoyed going to shows. Uh, backstage was nothing like what I envisioned with bowls of cocaine and <laughs> scantily clad women. It was hard to even get a beer usually back there, uh, but it was who's fun. The, um, who was the first artist that uh, you dealt with through uh, through Lakeland? Uh, there was. That? Buddy Guy was from Chicago, and he was pretty hot at the time. And he had a bass player named Greg Arzab, who I'm still friendly with now. Play, he's currently, if the world starts up again, plays with uh, John May on the Blues Breakers. So it's a blues guy, you know. I'm not a big blues fan. I always say blues are a lot more fun to play than they are to listen to. <laughs> Just a joke, guys. Don't get mad at me. Uh, but. Greg was a cool guy. He was close enough, so he'd pop to the shop when he want. And we made the the first bass I made. Uh, we actually were making two concurrently, one for the company and then one for Greg. And he used it. It made a television debut in October of '94 on Conan O'Brien, or '93. Might have been 93. I'm a little mixed up. Anyways, so he was the first guy. Then I started to, you know, I was friendly with Bass Player Magazine at that point. I was advertising. I said, you know, you did an article on, I love Dwight Yoakam, country rock, big fan. And I always liked Dwight. So I wanted, I sent a letter to his bass player, Taras Perdoniak, and he answered me. I mean, bass players generally don't get a lot of attention. So it was great. And as soon as, you know, we started getting some visibility, then they did start to come. And uh, 
get a phone message this Tony Garnier from Bob Dylan <laughs> I remember I, I when we were starting and I was the only one in the office I had like 30 messages backed up that was real bad and then I got this message from Tony and I was like oh my god <laughs> I can't believe it uh, one day in the first year I picked up the phone and it's like hi this is Pino Palladino you know I was it was mind-blowing you know yeah. I was I was in awe but I really and I would research these guys it's kind of like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with podcasts um, a guy named Mark Marin does an interview show you, he does his homework, and when he talks to these actors, musicians, whoever they may be, he knows what they've done and knows what to talk to them about. So I would always research the player. They were coming into town and get all the CDs. You know, it was before Wikipedia, but, you know, do the best I could. And uh, I would really get the guy in the car and start interviewing him, <laughs> so to speak. And, and I just, I did that a lot. And uh, within two or three years, we had a really nice artist roster. And it just made it easier and easier, you know. So, and most of my marketing was instruments for artists. And I was happy with the trade. I usually, you know, occasionally, I remember Chris Cheney was a friend and I'd given him a couple bases. He plays with Jane's Addiction and a lot of other Tommy Lee and stuff and uh, he did an article for bass player and he had his old fender and I mean old fenders are cool and I understand that but you know and I said something to him and he apologized and I felt bad because you know if it's it's like also if I, there were companies like fender I believe that would have contracts and they would tell players if you're going to be on TV you got to use the guitar if we're giving it to you you know, and I was never, I'm not going to tell a guy what to use. You know, I don't, we're like a carpenter with a toolbox. And, you know, I don't know what tune you're playing and what it is. So I was very easygoing and, and I was very responsive, not just to artists, but customers. And I think I did pretty well and I enjoyed that. And uh, I am uh, uh, back now to selling direct. At Lakeland, when, when we began selling it was pretty much uh, you sell to dealers dealers sell to the consumer and the prices get ramped up because everybody's got their hands and the you know ending up in the consumer's pocket yeah. but there was no other way uh, now you can buy a bass from Fender or a guitar from Gibson and mm -hmm. won't think twice and uh, also there used to be a list price and dealer price and then the consumer negotiated his price which I never liked it's like a, a product should have a price and now that's like that with map you know everybody sells at the same price and if you sell below you can lose your dealership you know maybe call it a demo or <laughs> accidentally nick it on purpose uh, but uh, but I enjoy now with what we're doing now, what I'm doing now is I'm basically making bases the same way that I did at Lakeland. I, I consider myself, you know, every, everybody should know I'm not a luthier. Uh, pretty good at setting up and, you know, that kind of stuff. But I'm not a, I don't do the fret work. I don't sand. I tried sanding about five minutes in. I said, forget this. I'd say it for me. Uh, what I do now is I produce like a movie producer I bring the bodies from one factory and they're great component factories now there's two one in Montana one in California I bring the bodies in uh, I match them to a neck uh, I give them to my builder and he does his work uh, then he then they have to go to the painter so so they come in right a body comes in uh, well, let's start even before. I got to send the wood to the company that carves them. So me, wood, company carves it, send it to me. I give it to my builder. He calls me a few days later. I come back, get it from him, send it to the finisher in California, Pat Wilkins. 
Uh, Pat Wilkins, it comes yeah. back to me, back to the builder, he puts it together, and then to the customer. And then there's also design work involved, and it's I'm real happy. I got a great team. It's small, but plenty uh, plenty of time to do what we need to. Uh, Kirk Hunter, who was a Lake Lakeland guy, does the uh, uh, the design work, and he's found a way to be very photo photorealistic. And he he not only does bases, but we work on amplifier designs. Uh, uh, Soon, I'm going to be working with an amp company very closely. We're not ready to announce that yet, but uh, but for right now, I sell bass amplifiers. I enjoy it. I have all the. I have four brands that I carry. I love them. Uh, mixing and matching. It's a great time to be a bass player. There's such great equipment. Uh, lightweight. Uh, I think modular bass systems with like single twelve. Put together three twelves. Much bigger sound than a single. 810 Ampeg, and the 810 Ampeg is 80 inches of speaker versus 312, 36. It's crazy. And the weight. I mean, I have an SVT. I'll never bring it to a gig. It's 80 pounds. So, uh, so, so back on the, uh, was it the topic of, we were talking about artists, signing artists, and let's talk a bit about the signature models. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're well, going to be yeah, doing a separate oh. video on the, on the chef. Uh, specifically, and we'll go into more detail on that. But let's talk about uh, like who was the first signature model? How'd that process go down with the development well, of that? It was very organic. I, I did not say I got to do a signature model. Uh, we were had success with the Music Man J active bass, but there was a whole contingency of players that were passive guys, mm -hmm. and, I, and I was not in that market. So we came up with. Uh, same body shape, we called it a 463, and it had two single coil pickups. And I forget, I read an article about Joe Osborne in Bass Player and fell in love. I mean, I had heard all these songs, but I went back and listened. I'm like, this is my guy. I love this guy. I called Bass Player. They gave me his phone number. I called him. Uh, it was kind of, he what happened was I hung up the phone. I wanted to know if somebody was at the address, and then I was going to FedEx a letter to him. He answered. I got nervous. I hung up. And then he <laughs> called me. They used to have something called Star 69. Yeah, I remember that. And they got me right back, and it was embarrassing. But within a couple of weeks, I invited him to Chicago. Uh, he liked the bass, the 463. He liked the sound. Uh, he had tried a... A Fender reissue. See, he, his bass was a 60 jazz bass, beat to hell. Beautiful bass. Funny, though. It had a very shitty E string. <laughs> and Joe's style avoided the E string, partially for that reason, and just his style, the way he played. Came out, and within a day of messing around the factory, we both came to the same conclusion. We need to make a jazz bass. And uh, we did that. And the Joe Osborne thing, uh, besides working with somebody who was my favorite bass player, if I could go back to when I'm 12, uh, is, is that we got a lot of kudos from up and coming and established bass players, especially like at the NAMM show. Like, we're so glad you're doing this for Joe. The world needs to know who Joe is. And with short of a couple articles, or one article, not many people really knew, knew much about him. But I dove into his back catalog. I came up with lists of songs he played on, uh, worked with getting him more press coverage, and uh, took him to the NAM shows, and people just were so happy to talk to him and hang out. I mean, there's one thing about great studio players, and you'll find this. You may meet some of them. They're great guys because people want them around. They're just, you know, you're not going to go far if you're abrasive. Yeah. You know, if you have an abrasive attitude. I met so, Ron Carter once and he was the nicest guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they just know how to hang out. And, and then they, they also know how to play. And uh, so that was great. Uh, then, then we 
Bob Glob was talk about a connector and a guy who knows everybody. You know, try to walk a damn show with Bob Glob. I mean, it's like impossible. Ten feet, he's talking. Two more feet, he's talking. Yeah, really, I just leave him. Said, forget it, Bob. I can't do this. But uh, we got together. Nobody had made a high end P base. It's funny, and Roger and I, I think, I mean, we're not real close, close friends. We had mutual respect. If somebody had an issue with Sadowski in Chicago, we were always there to help, and vice versa. Uh, and he came up to me at the show and he goes, I understand, you know, the jazz bass, obviously. <laughs> from He goes, well, I don't really see the P bass. <laughs> and I, I just said, well, we're going to try it. Uh, and a couple years later, he was making P's. So, uh, and Bob, Bob, we said, well, who can we get to play a P bass? Oh, they got to be alive. So uh, we were like, Duck Dunn. Bob, do you know him? Oh, yeah, I, I can get him. I can get a hold of him. Duck turned out to be the nicest guy in the world. And then he knows a guy. Next thing you know, I'm making a, I made a, a P bass for Chris Squire, you know, and, and it's funny. I thought Chris's sound was the Rickenbacker, right? Pick up the Rick and with a pick and a round one. He picked up the, the glob, sounded just like the Rick. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just a guy, his hand, yeah. you know. Uh, but I ended up meeting and working with almost every bass player I ever wanted to, short of Paul McCartney, I met and hung out uh, John Entwistle. We never did anything together that made it. We were working on something when he passed away. Mm -hmm. But uh, Rolling Stone did an article uh, about the top 50 bass players. It came out about six months ago. And I worked with 10 of them. I was really proud of that. You know, That's I got... Awesome. I got in, and uh, you know it's been it's been it's been great. Uh, Lakeland ended in 2010. Fine, we were never we never made a lot of money. A uh, couple years we were break even, which was good, but it just couldn't sustain it financially. And uh, in 2010, we're just about to just shutter it. I mean, the economy was real bad at that time. Mm -hmm. And the, my partners, the, who I mentioned earlier that I started playing with, uh, one of the brothers, Piracella, worked with me from, I hired him in 98, 97. So he was always there. But they found an investor. Uh, I say they, because it was John and his brother, Bo, was in charge of Hanson Pickups that made all the electronics for Lakeland after 2005. And, but there was no room for me. It was a hard thing to do. Uh, the last couple of years were, I spent two years trying to find somebody to buy the brand. I mean, I had an amazing story. I had amazing players. Nobody would touch me. Uh, I even, I tried to get a job as a salesman at Sweetwater. They told me I didn't know enough about equipment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, in all fairness, they, they, they do skew towards uh, recording equipment, which I don't know a lot about. Uh, but, I couldn't find anything. So I got out. I, I had no choice. And we sold in 2010. Uh, I thought about, I wanted to be a dealer for Lakeland, but that didn't work out because there was another dealer close by. Uh, went back to work with the family business. And after my non-compete, which was a gentle three years, not a big deal. And in 13, I, I found a factory and in uh, Korea and we made a line of bases and I, they were great. They were U S built hard hardware with Korean manufacturing out of a factory called mirror music. They were really good bases, but they weren't my best. They weren't as good as my U S stuff. So that was always kind of trouble tiresome on the, on the topic of Korea. Let's rewind a bit and talk about the Lakeland Skylines and how those oh, came about. Yeah, kind of a love-hate with Skyline because we wanted to be in the lower price point. We couldn't do it domestically. We were, we're paying $300 to paint a body. A manufacturer with the right paint booth who does just as good a job as what we're hiring a guy for $300 uh, pays about $20 to paint a guitar. We couldn't compete there, uh, and uh, 
So we ended up finding a, a manufacturer. Do you know the brand Court? C O R T. Yes. Okay, Court. The brand house brand from a, a guy named Jack Westheimer who's passed away. He came to the factory. He was in his mid seventies. Uh, he looked at our our procedure. He said, "I've never." He's been in the business at that point 50 years. I've never seen attention to detail like you have in your shop. And I thought that was a compliment, but he really was saying I was spending way too much time on each <laughs> instrument. And uh, he said, uh, I said, well, if we get in the price point of, you know, 800 to 1200, it won't be as bad. He goes, it'll be worse. They'll be, those players are really picky. And he was right. Uh, the uh, the Skyline series was a made in Korea. Uh, the design they they were they could make the hardware. We we had hip shop tuners after the first year, uh, and it was a good product. Uh, the weight the bodies were heavier than U.S. made, uh, and we had we couldn't let them out with the frets the way they were. So we ended, we were filing frets, which is a laborious and difficult proposition. Then we, we bought a Plex machine and they still do that. So those bases play well, but again, they're not my best. All my artist work was with USA bases. So, and it got to, yeah. So originally were, were you um, basically having them built in Indonesia and then shipped over to your shop where you would basically, you guys would basically do the once over, do the, the actual yeah. fret work and polish them up. And well, not them nice. we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do all the, we would just file the frets. We wouldn't yeah. re them. Uh, right. like, we, and on the O2 series that had the U S electronics, we would install the electronics. This is stupid. We should have sent the electronics, but we never had enough money to buy that big pile of electronics and send it to them. We did it and we ended up, so we had U S in our shop. We were installing the electronics on the O2 series. The O1 one series had Korean made electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, we were putting a lot of time and hence we were not profitable on it. Uh, and then, you know, we, uh, the last, 07 was my biggest year. We did almost 2 million in business. We had like 2000 skylines, but it, I mean, I could have been selling toasters. It just, it, I never felt that great about the, the skylines. I had people that loved them and told me they changed their life. And it was fantastic. But to me, it was like, okay, that's good. But maybe someday you'll get to play my real stuff. And I didn't like the fact that my stuff was so expensive, but you know, people got to realize a Fender, for example, from 1961, a jazz bass cost four hundred dollars, three to four hundred. Well, that's three thousand dollars. A Fender was a high-end instrument, yeah. And I think a real instrument. Now there's some great stuff, especially now, uh, the Sire stuff. There's some great stuff at low prices, and it's economies of scale as you go up. With the higher price points, you re you're really not getting, you know, as much bang for your buck. But for me, and the amount of time I have left on this earth, I only want to be playing the best that's available. And so that's what I'm back doing now, uh, with, uh, like I mentioned, a couple of Lakeland guys. Uh, one thing at Lakeland, if I had paid my employees per piece rather than per hour, I might still own Lakeland. I mean, a simple thing like that, uh, because we would always <laughs> at Lakeland, not trying to go back too much to, but the, the, we would figure out, I knew what my raw materials cost and I did time study and time study to figure out what my labor hours were. And it never added up no matter what. I mean, it was just like where we're supposed to be making $200 a base and some years we lost $200 a base. It, it, I hated that part. I hated that part of the business and keeping track of all that. But now I, I'm doing much better than I thought I would. So D Lake and we did the Korean thing. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't get the market to pay. I needed to sell those retail for between a thousand and 1200. And I, even though my name is well known to a lot of people, the brand couldn't sell the base at that price. 
It was a base that the market wanted to pay about $800 for, and at that price, I couldn't make any money. So 2016, so I made them for three years. Um, the headstock was not very well received, and I, uh, I got out in 16. Pretty much swore off the business. I, I'll never do this again. I'm done. I became depressed. <laughs> Uh, I suffer from bipolar, so I've had some issues with that, and I never thought I'd get back into it. And in 2018, I was, was playing a lot of guitar, and this Lakeland builder, who also helped me with the Korean stuff on setups, a guy named Dan Strat, uh, was making tellies and strats out of old wood from building sites. So I said, you know, I always liked George Harrison's Rosewood telly he played on the roof. Uh, so Dan made me a telly that was walnut, not rosewood. Walnut's lighter weight, mm -hmm. still works. And I loved it. And I was like, and he, and he had Lakeland like that volute we were looking at with the headstock. He was make he was using these things that were that came out of Lakeland. I was so proud, and he was doing so well. And I was like, well, maybe we I can do this again. <laughs> so. Third time's a charm, and in, uh, we spent the latter part of most of 2019 developing a short scale because as a guitar player, which I was spending more time on guitar than bass, I loved the feel of it, and it was so easy, and it's the scale length, was I, I really enjoyed it. And I said, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with short scale basses, but there were a couple guys, like Bill Wyman always used short, uh, Phil Lesh had a particular, the Grateful Dead had a particular sound in the early 70s that I knew was from a short scale. Mm -hmm. uh, Pyramid Gold Strings, Bisonics, and all these things added up. And I said, let's do, let me do a short scale. I love the Music Man guitars. Let's use that body shape. The Bisonic pickup, which is being made better than ever by Curtis Novak. I want to ask uh, you about that, actually. Oh, um, my God. So the Bisonics, uh, if I remember correctly, back in the mid late two thousands, you were popping those in uh, some U.S. Lakelands and a lot of some them, yeah. skylines. Well, I became a f well. First of all, you got a little bit about them. The Bisonic is a product that came out of Sweden. Hagstrom was a company in the early sixties. I don't know why they came up with it. It's a single coil pickup. It's got an adjustable pole. It's, if you look at it, go to Curtis's website, look at the, it looks better and more complicated than any other pickup you've ever seen. And these little, the, the, the whole apparatus to move the, the pole pieces up, which is really easy with a flathead screwdriver. Mm -hmm. boop, boop. Uh, but the thing about it was the tone, the tone was incredible. Starfire bases from Guild used that pickup. They bought yep. them and then the guys in San Francisco, the Alembic people, Rod, Rod, Rick Turner, they realized these were great pickups. And Phil Lesh, even going back to uh, the second great that album, it's called Anthem of the Sun. Listen to the bass sound. It's amazing. And that was just a starfire. And they also found a way to even make it better. And what they did was they added a, a big slug of Alco. Uh, the, the original Hagstrom had one piece of Alco. They said, let's try a little stronger magnetic field. And they added this second piece. And that was not available for many, many years. And a guy named Fred Hammond came out with the Dark Star pickup. Yes, and they were sir, really yes. expensive. They were three times as much as a Lindy Fralin. Uh, but I was so happy. Uh, and I saw a movie of uh, the hell, Festival Express, and it was Grateful Dead. It was from 1970. They were playing on it. It was a train rock and roll show, Janis Joplin. It was, it was a great show. And I could see Phil's bass was a, a, a Gibson, but it had the Bisonics. Because what 
at the at the time in the early 70s alembic was making their first base for phil they took his starfire and said we're going to redo it we're going to make you better pickups so here here's your pickups he threw them in a gibson and that little gibson short scale pyramid gold strings the best bass sound still to this day is on he's on so many records in those two years uh maybe i'll put a list together and send them up but uh Grateful Dead records, solo records, David Crosby records. And I know the sound of this bass is incredible. Mm -hmm. the, the Biosonic to me is hands down the best sounding bass pickup I've ever I've ever worked with. Uh, at Lakeland, we really wanted, we said, well, if we can just get the tone, we don't need that fancy pole piece. Although it's nice to have adjustable poles, we didn't think that was necessary, so we, we got rid of that, but we kept the coil the same size, same amount of turns. Then we said, this is where we might have gone wrong. Maybe they, the strong magnetic field, maybe we can use a neo magnet because it's a stronger magnet, less expensive, less space. The slugs of Alnico and a Bisonic take up a lot of space, big pickup. And we did all these changes, and we got it together, and we had a cover made, which is very expensive. To have a plastic cover, a mold, seven, eight thousand dollars. We put it together, and it was so disappointing because we changed too many things, mm -hmm. and it, they didn't sound as good as, as the Bisonic. The best way for me to describe a Bisonic is like take a great Fender bass, good strings, put it into a B15, EQ it, put compression on it, make it fat and big, do all that. The Bisonic does that right into the amp, okay? It's like a well-produced bass sound. Uh, we, we were never able to get Fred, who doesn't make them anymore, he he just got out of the business, and luckily Curtis Novak picked it up. Mm -hmm. And he does them in white cream, and I saw some tie-dye too. But but uh, anyways, the, uh, the, the, so Fred tried to do a five-string, and uh, he's not... Fred was not a pickup maker. He was a Grateful Dead fan who got into it by just reversing the Hagstrom. And it was expensive because the Bisonic has, uh, there's a lot of components to it. Let me see if I can get it in the picture. Uh, yeah. You see the chrome surround? Well, that's a stamped piece. That's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then there's a black pla plastic piece in the middle that's expensive. You need a mold for that. The tooling for a Bisonic is like four times as much as for like a, a regular. I'm talking like twenty, thirty thousand. 30,000. So I was really glad that Curtis picked it up. But Fred tried to make a five. It was miserable. Didn't work. Didn't, didn't have the right recipe. Uh, Curtis has talked about it, but uh, I haven't seen anything yet. I'm very excited that Curtis is doing a guitar pickup and he can use the same size chrome surround there you go it. so uh we're very excited we'll be the first manufacturer to use it because nice. uh, d lakin is coming out with a design that has been overlooked by the market quick guitar note here uh music man had two guitars from 78 from 76 to 80, they did a Stingray guitar and then a Sabre guitar. Uh, they did not do them concurrently. It was the Stingray, and then boom, it was the Sabre, and then they got out, okay? And those guitar, now the basses we know always did well. They were an instant hit. The Stingray bass was successful from day one, but the guitars did not catch on. There are a few, you can only point, I can only point to a few instances where they were used by artists like they're good ones paul barrar from little feet used them on waiting for columbus which is like the best live album of all time uh, alex weir is a funk guitar player who played with the talking heads on yeah. stop making sense the movie and he uses two of them in the movie besides that you don't see them why why it's like to me it's like a hit a song you say that's a hit record how could that not be a hit record? It's a perfect record. Don't mean to be too little feet heavy, but there's a song called Easy to Slip. I don't know why it's not a hit. 
I think it's a crime it's not a hit. I feel the same way about the Music Man guitars. And I've heard, and I know Sterling, uh, I don't know if he knows what I'm up to yet, but he I don't think he'll care because he does not make them. And he, I've seen him say in interviews, the guitars were, were awful. So we got rid of the guitars, and now they make great guitars. Yeah, they the found a four their niche. headstock. I'm doing a six on the side. I'm doing the Music Man headstock. Nobody's using it. So I'm going to, and we're coming out with a saber. Uh, we just finished the mold for the pickups. And I think this, the thing is, it's an active. Now, bass players, we're used to active. We accept it active. Guitar players never did. Now, is it the battery? I mean, guitar players don't seem to mind boxes with 9-volt batteries. So, uh, you know, I think it's time to give another shot. And you got to do it the right way. You, you know, guitar players are used to volume, tone, full up, and let's go. If you take a Music Man guitar and you turn the bass and treble up full, you're missing the whole beauty of it. Because yep. the whole EQ, you start at zero with the bass and treble all the way down, and then you come out with it. Uh, but the original guitars had two humbucking pickups with a switch that allowed it to be in and out of phase. When you went out of phase, they were both pickups, so you had your pickup selector was gone. It didn't need to be there. But out of phase is a thinner sound, mm -hmm. Fender. In phase, Gibson. And I, I believe I'll be able to show people this guitar can do the Gibson, Fender, and to be honest, Strats, Tellys, Les Pauls, they bore me. They just do. Uh, jazz basses and P basses don't bore me. <laughs> or, or music bands. But those guitars, I just, you know, I think it's time to get some new stuff. I mean, there's PRS and there's... Um, Duesenberg, boy, those are amazing. There's this amazing products at amazing prices. So, I have talked a lot. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem, no problem. <laughs> I enjoy listening. Um, on the topic of pickups, though, so we talked about the dark stars. We talked about putting those and uh, and the development of those. And then um, let's brush upon the Chi Sonics. How did those come Chi about? Chi Sonics. Chi. Well, that, I, I I've been three. saying it wrong all these years. <laughs> yeah, I actually went through it all, but I, I'll go. Oh, I'll, you, you're, th those were the ones that you developed then. Those with the with the new mold. We were trying then. to. We were trying gotcha. to give the tone, the tonality of the Bisonics in a less expensive pickup, and they have they they have their own thing. But they were very, to me, it was very disappointing. That was a very sad day because you don't know what it's going to all sound like until right. you have flat work made. So you got the right magnets in, and then it was like, well, it doesn't sound right. We'll go back to scatter wind or linear winding. There are things you could do, but it just it just never worked out. So uh, at the end of Lakeland, Joe Osborne was used, realized how good the Biosonics were. I, I, I don't know why. I mean, I'm making a bass with Music Man pickups for myself next, but and I am going to make a J and a P, so I have those in my arsenal. But my heart will be in these Bisonics, the uh, single pickup one that I that I have with yeah, me. Yeah, I saw that. That uh, looks great. The, the double pickup model, um, I have one of those made. Uh, I sent it to Mike Gordon from Fish. I saw He's that. He's a big fan of, of the Grateful Dead uh, tonality. He knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I sent him my two pickup. And now he's got it hostage until I make him his. I can't get mine back till I make his. But I, I'm really excited because short scales are like a whole new world. Now, first of all, it's the opposite of what you would think. You would think longer scale, bigger tone, right? Makes sense. The truth of the matter is the longer you go, think of a piano and the mm -hmm. low strings on a piano. The longer you go, the clearer you go. So if you want Chris Squire, Entwistle, yes, long is where you want to be. If you want a big, thick, rich sound, short scale, it'll beat at any time. And it's easier to play. Yeah. I mean, the first position, one, two, three, four, I can do. You know, I, I play upright positioning on a 34 where I use one, two, four. You don't use the third on upright. Mm -hmm. One, two, four. 
and you play only F to G. But on a short scale, I can go one, two, three, four, uh, and play things like stuck in the middle with you without you know having to take a rest in the middle. Uh, I just am so excited about it. And honestly, I, I've got the la first Lakeland, and then I've got a Lakeland that has uh, by Sonics that's autographed by Adam Clayton. Those are the only two long, and I've got a Stingray and a GNL in homage for Leo's stuff. Uh, and those are the only long scales I'll ever own. And now it's just a matter. I've always been one to just build what doesn't exist because I want it. I, I remember one guy who's a player out of uh, California, and I, I said to him, uh, well, I'm making it this way. We're going this way because I like it. He's like, you can't just do it because you like it. I said, yes, I can. <laughs> it's my company. I can do it how I want. So it's fun now. and uh, That's what it's about. We in hopefully in in the next around Christmas I'll have five short scales, two of the 1930s, a third 1930 with a Music Man pickup at the bridge for a Jocko sound, and then a P and a J, and then I'll be good. And then well I might want to make like an Alembic style, um, Alembic style Phil Lesh bass. I, I don't know my list. I, I, I'm knocking them off, but uh, I'll stay with the short. I'm going to stay with short. And I think, you know, from a commercial point of view, it makes sense. There are so many great 34-inch bases on the market and in people's collections already. There's not a lot of high-end short scales. There's Nordstrom makes some interesting stuff. Um, what's his name? He used to work at Lakeland. Sirik. 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 Yeah, Greg makes stuff, yeah. stuff. His you stuff's know? been getting a lot of visibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never met him, but I've talked to him on the telephone and, uh, and by email. And uh, but I think short scale, and I see him everywhere. I see him every time I see a band on TV. And I just went into my T-bone. I'm, I'm gonna start looking at more on MTV to see. But I see short scales everywhere. And the yeah. Mustang is really the the biggest selling short scale of all time at this point. The bodies are just a little too small. I, uh, when I got into this, I was like, the guitar size is perfect. Let's work with that. And uh, when we when we designed the P and the J, they, we didn't just say, all right, let's take a jazz and we're going to do it three quarters. So 75%. Yeah. And we tried that, but the body turned out to be not right. So my designer and I, we worked together just visually on paper, uh, and then built models with cardboard to see how they balance. And uh, so I, you know, I've got a full line. Uh, the the P and the J are in production now. So, uh, you know, short scales, it, they're a lot of fun. They it's are. All, um, and I, I'm hoping you'll do, take me up on my offer. I want to send you oh, absolutely. the whole gaggle of them, and I'll give you all three, and you could look at all of them together. Absolutely, and uh, in regards to those short scales, what's the uh, the price range for like the P and the J? Is the deal the ones that you're now, coming out? All my bases are in the same price point. Okay, uh, they start at thirty six fifty. Um, the by um, thirty seven fifty. The short scale, uh, the Bisonic is a more expensive pickup yeah. than a than a set of Lindy Frail, a single. Novak. I mean, it's, they're about $250, $300 each, whereas a, a set of Fralins cost me less than $150. So that's the price point. And then, so I add, making two of them is get kind of an expensive base. And then I have some options. Another thing I'm so excited about, I don't have a sample here, is the, the uh, Spitfire Tortoise. As a manufacturer, I was always disappointed in the tortoise shell. And everything, even like Fenders from after CBS took over, the tortoise looked horrible all of a sudden, and it never got good. We we had a pretty good material from WD, and uh, but anyways, this guy came out. I think I hooked up in like 2015, and he had the real stuff with one catch. It was three hundred dollars a pick guard, so and that's crazy. You know, yeah. the manufacturer will budget maybe $10, $5 for a white pick guard, and maybe 20 for a tortoise. This guy's at 300 but I love it. I love it because 
He knows how to do it. Nobody else does. And the most manufacturers won't touch them. They're afraid of that Yeesh. price. And I'm like, just pass it along and make it an option. Look, at, at, I knew the Korean tortoise is horrible and it wasn't just Korean. It was worldwide. Tortoise was bad. When I came up with my D-Lake and white pick guards on everything, and it's just like, because they can't screw up white. White, yeah. black, white looks fine. Or mint, maybe. But let the player then decide for himself if he wants to upgrade. So there's great pickups. Hipshot makes fantastic stuff. I'm trying to get him to do, uh, what do you call the uh, type of tuners? Not locking tuners. Uh makes it easier to string a guitar, but it's more issues with guitars because you don't uh, change a lot on bass. But locking, locking tuners? Yeah, locking know? tuners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Hipshot makes great stuff. Uh, the pickup guys, besides Novak, there's Nordstrom, there's uh, Fralin, there's it's just, it's, it's amazing. Great now, stuff, great time. In regards to pickup configurations, Recently, mm -hmm. a particular configuration has become very popular. You see it in the lower, some of the lower end bases nowadays, but you're also seeing it in some higher end stuff uh, in Europe, in uh, out of Sandberg, and that's the P Music Man combo. You know what? I I was trying to figure out what it was when you told me, and I wasn't sure. I haven't done that. I'm I'm kind of proud because I didn't invent the Music Man J, but I did make it popular. It's like the Henry Ford of the Music Man J. Uh, Warwick made a dolphin bass. I yeah. read the review. They said you pull up on the on the volume and you drop a coil, and then it becomes a jazz bass. I said that's brilliant. You can do the best of Leo Fender with a Music Man J, especially on a Bartolini where the J is two coils, like a P pickup. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, so. I got it. I got the config from Warwick, but I remember like three years in, I walked around Nam and I took at least forty pictures of instruments with Music Man J. I mean, it's just, it's just one of the norms now, and that mm -hmm. was pretty. Cool. But I haven't gotten into the music, of uh, the 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 P bass Music Man. Uh, I am because of the low rider. And the way the music man sounds, I mean, right up against the bridge. I'm talking yeah. about right. And how instant Jocko. Uh, I'm making myself a fretless with a music man at the bridge and then another one. I, I like matching sets for various reasons. But, you know, one at the bridge and then one maybe a little, an inch north of a P bass. And to have a neck pickup. And then, you know, uh, or I think, or maybe I'll put it right under the neck. I love neck pickups. Fender basses do not have neck pickups. P bass is as close as you get, or G bass, J, jazz bass has a neck pickup, but not a real, think about McCartney. Yeah. His Rickenbacker and his Hofner both had neck pickups. Uh, the Hofner, the real cool one is the Cavern that has two neck pickups. Yeah. Because that way you can put them both on, they can hum cancel, and you're right there. So. If I ever find somebody that can help me make a semi-hollow, I'll do that. But um, honestly, for me, the Bisonic doesn't get better. Just doesn't get better. Curtis owes me for this. One question. Yeah. Uh, so I remember Lakeland came out with the the HB30. Was that after you were – were you involved in the, the creation of that, the little 30? At their short scale? Yeah. No. What, what that was, and it was after me. I don't know much about it. But – they, the court, court had some designs that they sold that were made in Indonesia, which is where production moved from Korea to Indonesia. And these b instruments that they made in Indonesia, we found other manufacturers that they built for. Mm -hmm. And we looked, and John looked and found that design being made by another company uh, and thought that it was cool. So they changed a few things mm -hmm. and that that base came from. Wow. I've never I've never tried one. Um but it's it's interesting. I don't know if it's still in production. I it don't actually know. it is. Uh 
I, I, I had to watch my uh, my trigger finger on a on a B stock okay. one. <laughs> what did it cost? About uh, for the for the B stock one, I think it was like eight hundred bucks or something like that. Oh, cool. uh, for Factory yeah. Direct. Yeah. Um, well, I, I again am uh, I'm just into the Fender Riveted. Yeah. And I, and I just like I like those, and I love the the shortness. One base model that I do remember was from when you were in uh, Lakeland. Uh, that just came to mind was the the hollow body, the third, the full scale hollow body. Yeah, that was a full scale to that. Tell me about that. How that I came was, to be. I was attempting. If you, there's a Grateful Dead album called American Beauty. It's one of their biggest oh, yeah. albums. Love it. Listen to the bass tone. It's it's amazing, and this is. Going back to 99, 2000, I didn't know what I learned about that from watching that train movie. I, I thought that part of the fill sound was the hollowness of the Starfire and the bass that Alembic remade for him. So I was chasing the Phil Lesh sound. The original had two Barlini pickups. I was friendly with Mike Tobias. He even came out and tried to help us get our manufacturing together. He was a great guy. He used to ride his motorcycle from New York to Nashville for the NAM. And I hated seeing him on a motorcycle. They scare me. Yeah, uh, too. But he, he came to Chicago and hung out, stayed at my house for a couple of days. And uh, anyways, what Mike was good at was ergonomics, okay, making a bass fit well and feel balanced and right. And Lakeland, quite frankly, we were not great at that. Uh, our first bass, the 494, which it became known as, and the 5594, has a treble cutaway that allows for easier access to the higher notes. But in my mind, it also it does not sit as well as a jazz or a P. So I went to Mike and I said, I want the most comfortable, I don't want a hard edge. And we came up with a, way to carve it it's a carved piece all the way it's a beautiful instrument all the way around and uh but it uh it was very expensive um i used one for many years myself i don't have one and i don't really have that much interest in it to be honest there it was it's cool and it, if you get one with a nice flame top it's a it's a very uh, well engineered well designed piece but most of the design would be from mike tobias and we event, we got close to the Phil Lesh thing when I started putting Bisonics in the hollow bodies. Yeah, I remember those. It wasn't easy to do because the pickups were so different, but we were able to to work it out. So those are good ones. If you can find a, a hollow body with Bisonics, either the Dark Star or the Novex, that's a pretty cool base. That it is. So yeah. we've co we've covered uh, a lot of the Lakeland stuff. We've talked about uh, the stuff you're doing right now with D. Lakin, uh, and we briefly touched on the low rider and then the stuff you were doing with Ashdown. Right. Where do you see you going in the future? Where Where do you see uh, Dan Lakin in, huh. in five years and beyond with uh, with the bass world? Well, I want to get more involved with amplification. Uh, and then, but base wise, I think I'm I'm on the right path. Uh, we've got a series called the Inspired series, which allows me to work with players. They don't they aren't all necessarily famous guys or even you know that, but they've helped me work together on a base. We draw it, we put it up on the website. Uh, we're working on a really cool one now with a New York guy named Zev Katz great bass player and uh it's a short scale uh with a mustang pickup and like a gold foil pickup uh but if you look at the inspired series it's about 12 designs uh i haven't made many of them yet so we draw them we put them up for sale we're doing like i'll give you a cool one that i'm real excited about we are actually making them huh. david hood who's one of the best bass players ever. He came out of Muscle Shoals. He's the bass player on uh, I'll Take You There. He's the bass player on Kodachrome. And mm -hmm. Just great sound. Could, and couldn't be, an, again, a studio guy. Couldn't be a nicer guy. But he bought a bass, <laughs> and he's even got the receipts. I have them on the website. 
his friend in 1960, he had a friend, they were in high school, his father owned a hardware store, but they got into playing, and he had his dad call Fender and say, I'm a hardware store, but I sell basses. So he was able to go to Fender and buy a bass from Fender, which would be about like 250 or $200 versus 300 Huge difference. Yeah. He got a Sunburst Jazz. I'm like, how did you even know the jazz existed? This is 1960 or early 61. He said, I saw an ad in Downbeat magazine. He had the ad from Downbeat. He had the receipt that his friend had. Really cool. But this bass, he was asked in 1973 or 72, Traffic, you know, the band Traffic, oh, yeah. asked him, the drummer from Muscle Shoals, to come on tour. But David said, I'm going on tour. And he looked at his old Fender bass, which at this point is 12 years in, and it's beat to shit. He said, this is not cool enough for a real rock and roll show. So he stripped it, and he stained it walnut brown, and he made a pickguard, a black pickguard, out of some floor tile material. And he made this bass, and he was so happy with it, within three months it was stolen. So sad. He he was heartbroken. He loved this bass. And uh, in 70, the 73, so he went to Manny's Music in New York, which is where the tour was, bought a brand new jazz. It was black jazz, maple neck, black blocks, I think. Hated it. And rightfully so. You know, I'm not going to bat... The CBS Fenders, especially from 73 through 78, are awful. They are poorly made instruments that are designed by accountants, not musicians, not builders. They're awful. And he knew it, and he says it on the website. I, I bought because I, I said, tell the story of this bass. And he, he, he said, I went and bought this bass, and they sucked. <laughs> you know. Uh, so we're, we're giving him, we decided to make the bass out of walnut, like the original Telecaster that Dan Strack made for me. Not just walnut, but old walnut from building sites. So this wood's over 100 years old. Uh, we're making a matte black pickguard. It'll come with a shiny pickguard, too, autographed by David. Stack knobs, like his original, and he wanted a kill switch. So we, we've added a kill switch. Nice. And that bass will be, uh, he ordered one, and his... Uh, Friends of his that run a radio station ordered one. So I've sold two. But I love working with these bass players and picking their brain. Like, what would be cool? And, you know, let's just put it on paper. We don't have to build it. If, you know, uh, so I'm doing that. And then I've got a classic series where I've got, like, Sunburst Jazz. Looks like John Paul Jones, Led Zeppelin. So mm -hmm. J.P. John Paul, JPJ, I've got a funk machine, uh, P bass with a pickup cover, James Jamerson style. I haven't built one, but I'm, I've got on the website a, photo, a drawing of a tractor bass. Do you know what that is? Barry Oakley, I don't know why they called it a tractor bass. Barry Oakley, the original bass for the Allman Brothers, took a jazz bass, took the neck pickup out, put a bisonic, so he was hip to it. And then at the bridge, he threw the other jazz bass pickup. So the bass has a bisonic and two J's in a bridge position. It's really wow. cool. I've never, yeah. played one. I've, I've never seen that. And I don't know why they call it a tractor bass, but they do. And So anyway, so the David Hood bass is actually called a swamper bass because the, the Muscle Shoals rhythm section is called... Uh, the Swampers. Uh, David, uh, there's a great documentary about the Muscle Shoals music scene. And it, if you watch it, the last five minutes, David is using a per Burgundy Mist Lakeland J, which is Osborne from 98, one of the first ones. And he's always been a fan since he's got that bass. And uh, so, but uh, it, it's a totally too. Ooh, he hated it. He hated it, but his wife said, <laughs> I like it. So he ended up taking it. There's a picture on my website of David with the, the pink bass, he called it. Osborne didn't like it either. Too, too feminine. But 
I mean, I got, I got one of those sparkly, uh, the, the Music Man BFRs, the 2020s. Oh, cool. Is that the big flake stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sparkly champagne pink with gold hardware. Yeah, I like stuff. I mean, I, I chased down gold flake for uh, Adam Clayton wanted. He had, I think it was an original Fender that had a gold finish and I had photographs. I couldn't get it made. I, I, I might have hung out hung on to him as an endorser if I would get that goddamn gold made, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> I love finishes, and there's a, uh, you know, the guitar paints are automotive paints. Yeah. You know, they were developed by DuPont and Lake Placid Blue and Surf Green and Seafoam Green. Those are all just like every year look at a car catalog, and they got, you know, these crazy names. For a couple of years in the late 50s, these all these names were used for General Motors cars, but there's a company that makes automotive paint called Vibrant Series, the same company that makes all the traditional. And there are so many cool colors I want to build, <laughs> and they all have. Here's one right here, Frost Silver, one of my favorites. But they have a code number. I don't know if you can read that. I'm not. Oh, well, I, right I can't see that. No. There's a. There's oh, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. yeah. The paint the code. code number, and it's cool. If you go to a body shop, right, they have a library of tints, and if you put the code into the machine that mixes, you can get the exact color that's on a particular car. Yeah. Because a car, think of there, a car is made, and you might have seven or eight companies that make painted parts that all have to match. So they use these formulas. It's really cool. So I there's a and we made we use some of these at D Lake and in Korea. There's another one called Emerald City. Oh, fantastic! Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like a British racing it. green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, that's really, I hope that's my favorite them. colors. But I think it's time to open, you know, the door to more colors. But they, you know, I love the opaques, sonic blue, seafoam greens. I love the metallics. Uh, translucence, I'm not translucence, I'm not as excited about, and quilt tops and flame tops are cool and they work on some styles of bases, but for me I like the pick guard, control plate, the metallics or if you have a black, white or sunburst, tortoiseshell you know, like if you put tortoiseshell on a Lake Placid Blue to me that looks like a refin because a lot of people that would repaint their fenders had the tortoise shell that came on it, mm -hmm. and they would. So if you see a metallic color with a tortoise shell guard, it just—I don't like it. It doesn't work. It's, it's so a on the topic of paint, it's, I'm glad you brought this up. I am actually—I reached out to a nail polish company. My girlfriend oh. loves nail polish. She has like over a hundred uh, indie brands that oh. are like. I'm talking crazy color shifting, holographic, all sorts of crazy stuff. And on, I reached on, out to... on, on nail polish, huh? Yeah. yeah. So I reached out to one of these brands because there's one particular color. I'll, I'll send it to you on a Facebook message after, and I'm actually going to post it here. Uh, okay. the, the brand is called Starly. Um, I'm going, and the, the color is called like Sunset Boulevard. And it's like oh, a yeah. pink that shifts to an orange, like a sunset. Depending on the oh, angle. Oh, okay. It's like because this this Color silver shift. this silver when it hits the light, it, it'll sparkle green and red. Mm -hmm. Shoot off of it. So I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of cool technology, you know, but with colors and paints. The primary ingredient of nail polish, nitrocellulose. Really? Yeah. You know the reason they stop making. The Fender, the beautiful tortoise, which really only existed from 60 to 65, uh, was nitrocellulose material that was highly combustible and very dangerous to work with. So they mm -hmm. changed not because CBS wanted it cheaper. They changed for safety reasons. Um, but now I don't know how the guy how the guy does it. The Spitfire pickguards, if you look it up, he's got a lot of different options too. You know, there's a particular look that I like better. They're all different. You know, people are like, oh, $300. I'm said, 
you you don't think twice about sending six hundred to a thousand for a flame top. I get more enjoyment out of my pick guard than I do from a flame top. You know. Anyways, but some people are still three hundred dollars. Forget it. That's crazy. The guy who makes them was at the Nam show, and uh, he went to Fender and show and the. They have master builders at Fender actually making guitars at the NAMM, and they were like, you know, foaming at the mouth to get get this material. And he's like, and then a guy from Fender comes over and he's like, yeah, it's $300. They're like, they came up with a huge amount. We'll give you 30 you know, but he wouldn't do it. So, anyways, sorry. I've talked too much about Tortoise. Oh, no problem. Uh, I mean, it, it's interesting how... Like, when you get into such a niche thing where, okay, you know, if, if you're just ha- rocking, like, you know, a glary jazz bass, you're not going to be popping on a $300 pick card. But, you know, if if this is your, your baby, like a Sadowski or a, a D. Lakin or uh, something of the like. Why not? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, your, well, your baby, even, your instrument. Even if it's a squad, if, if you fall in love, of with a squire or a sire or what you know why not dress it up i i think i think at any price point a pick card like that would could add to it could add to the the overall aesthetic of it and make whatever whatever brings you to the instrument yeah whatever whatever you do to the instrument that calls you to say come play me that's what you should put on yeah you can't Regardless isolate a specific yeah. like factor of a bass that you like cool. because it's the whole the whole package the 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 tone the look the feel everything together it makes it what it is and you can't just ignore uh, the aesthetic part of it especially if like you want some real tort you got you, you got to pay to play right you know and, 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 and... oh you're you're breaking up a little bit nowadays with YouTube, there's a lot of ways to, to find out. Like, people see the price of our bases, and there's a lot of... I'm sorry. I, I don't know why it's breaking up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No? Anyways, I forgot. So... <laughs> but there, there's a lot of there's a lot of great great instruments on the market. It's a good time to be a player. Yeah. And uh, amplifiers, lightweight stuff. Uh, you know, and... It, if there's a particular sound that you hear and you're trying to figure out how to get it on a bass, um, let me know. I, I love to solve a tonal problem, figure out you know what we could do to make make something make something work. So that's actually great that you brought that up. For all the people watching out there, leave a comment down below and talk about your favorite bass tone. And if you're curious of how to get it, maybe we can uh, gather a few answers and on the next interview we can uh, talk about that kind of stuff. That sounds good. One other thing I'll leave you with. I don't know if you have a way to to do it, but my builder I work with has two videos that I think you should check out. One of them is making a D lake in bass. You know, he gets a painted body and he gets the components, but the fretwork is fascinating how he does because the Lakeland method is not really fretting, it's refretting. We start with an oversized slot and we epoxy the frets in. That's a refret technique, mm-hmm. uh, but it makes for a very exacting fingerboard and a lot of fret height left. In this video, it's an eight minute time lapse and shows you how much work, you won't believe how much work goes into it. Uh, then he did a video of building a guitar, a Les Paul, with a carved top from the ground up. And that's a 23-minute video that's got over 12 million hits. It's a viral video. He gets like 20,000 to 30,000 hits a day. And it's fascinating. Wow. But this guy, is name's Dan Strack. He's amazing. He's we're working together now, hand in hand, and I'm so lucky to have them. And uh, check that out. Absolutely. You... So using the magic of editing, we're going to superimpose clips of those videos <laughs> while you're talking about them. And Super. for anyone who wants to, wants to watch the whole video, I will leave links to those videos down below so you can check them out as well. Uh, I think we're going to call it. Thank you so much, yeah. Dan, for taking the time to chat. 
Uh, we're going to have you on again, of course. It's always a pleasure to chat with you, and uh, wish you got the best of luck. And until we talk again, my friend. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it.